everyone, this is Dante at Ferrigno Freedom Channel, and I'm coming to you today. We're going to be joining with Miles Moore of Big Mo Cattle, and I've been looking forward to having this conversation all week because I've got some concerns about what's going on with our meat supply. I don't want to be overly alarmist on this, but I do want to share some information with you that I've been discovering and talk about some things that are going on in the cattle raising industry that could be real important, especially for us carnivores. So as soon as he's ready to join, I'll bring him into the conversation and we'll get going. Hey, there he is. Hey. There he is. There he is. All right. We got sound and everything. I love it when a plan comes Good together. Good deal. Good to see you again, Miles. Good to see you. Good to see you. How you been doing? Doing great. Absolutely doing good. Doing good. I've really been enjoying the diet and uh, I've got my son on it and I've got one of my business partners on it now. And so we're doing our thing. That's great. How's it been? How has it been working out for you? How long you been doing it now? Uh, about a month. I've been doing it just over four weeks. I lost 25 pounds so far and uh, I've reached a plateau the last three days i hadn't lost anything last three days but i'm sure that'll change so uh keep looking at that scale going man what would happen to that great you know almost one pound a day i was losing <laughs> so yeah you, you got to get rid of that scale man at least don't look at it but maybe once a month or something like that i know it's hard you want to see the progress but you're gonna see some additions and that's that'll that'll mentally set you back so yeah so I'm, 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 uh, I'm feeling good i'm feeling really good and uh, it's it's um, it's helped my play on the pickleball court. It's just my attitude. Everything has been great. It's been really good, really good. So I'm uh, I'm having fun, and and uh, you know I'm doing my own thing. Uh, kind of you know like when I when I make meat, I make a big amount of it, and that way I don't have to cook very often. And I just warm it up, put some broth over it, and warm it up, and here we go. Yeah, that's exactly how I started. I started off with making a lot of meat because I knew I wanted to make sure I had something ready to go in case I had a craving or something. I didn't want to give in because I had to spend 20 minutes getting something ready or even longer in some cases. Yeah, it's just easier for me to 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 do a bunch of it one time. And so, yeah, I'm cooking probably, oh, I don't know, 15 pounds at a time or so and, and just stick it in the fridge and so, uh, you know, making the broth up and, and, and uh, you know, I, I really have kind of adapted a way of, I don't really cook anything without some bones, you know, and then I just take all of that juices and the bones and put them in a pot, add a little water and then cook them for 36, 48 hours and uh, make bone broth. And then so all the meat that I have, I cut it up and then put, you know, hot bone broth over it and heat it up and I've got a great stew again to go again. So I love that you're making full use of the animal like that too, and taking advantage of every bit of what's there. So that's, that's always wonderful too. You know, that uh, for those who would be watching the, the show now, this is Miles Moore of Big Mo Cattle, and he's where I buy my whole cows from because I just love the way he raises his animals and, and also how he treats the land. And we're going to get into a little bit of that today. But I've had some concerns with the store-bought industry when it comes to what I get from the store when it comes to cattle raising. And I'd like to talk to you about some of them because I'm not an insider on this. I watch what everybody else is watching. And I know I've seen uh, a lot of people on YouTube, including Russell Brand, has gone into a lot of information on what's going on with vaccines, which is so amazing to see him doing a news channel now. But he's doing a pretty good job of it. So yep. I thought we could uh, touch on some of the things that might be concerning some other people. The thing that really got me started to be worried about it was when I was reading Metabolical. And I don't know if you're familiar with the book, but it was a book by Doc, Dr. Robert Lustig. And he goes into a lot of detail on processed foods and yep. what's been done to our food supply. But he mentions about meat, something that I didn't really realize it was that often. And it has to do with, with uh, antibiotics. Uh, antibiotics i figured maybe they just used them when the animal was sick or something like that but he seemed to imply that they happen a lot more often and that's when i started to get concerned because i've noticed a difference from when i eat the meat i get from you and when i eat the meat i get from the store a lot of times my stomach makes a lot more noise when i eat the meat i get from the store 
And I know back from when I started, before I started this diet, one of the things I think that really caused a lot of my issues was I was taking a lot of antibiotics. I went through three rounds back to back of heavy antibiotics, uh, trying to get over something back in, I think it was 2019 or somewhere in that area. And so I've been trying to avoid antibiotics ever since. But there's other concerns that I have that we've talked about before, and I thought it would be great for you to be able to share uh, so we could start off with basically my first questions would be is, are you aware of, uh, of commonly used processes in raising cattle that lessen the cost of raising cattle, but might also be less advantageous, less advantageous for the people who are eating the cattle, uh, eating the meat from those cattle? And if you can name and describe some of those practices. Sure. Um, first of all, let's touch on the antibiotics. And what a lot of people don't understand is there's antibiotics put in a lot of the feed into the livestock feed. And the reason being is because they've got so many animals packed in a small spot that if they give them the antibiotics, you know, beforehand, then they don't get as much sickness. And uh, so they try to keep the animals on a, you know, somewhat of a level playing field for the gain and it's all about the gain on those animals whether it be chicken or or beef or pork or what it is the weight gain weight gain so the reality is when you put an animal on antibiotics there will be some some gain just from them being having the antibiotics mm. uh, so it isn't just uh, when they get sick now they will up them if they have some kind of an outbreak uh, from what i've seen in the past the other thing you have to realize is Cattle raising across the country is different in different areas. Uh, you know, where my farm is here in South Georgia, we're in what they call the coastal plain. And our soil conditions, our minerals, you know, everything's different than what it would be in, say, Nebraska or, or Idaho or even up in New York or, you know, whatever. So there's differences in the environment that the cattle live in. And there's also going to be differences in the way different farmers treat their cattle and different farmers' expectations on the cattle. And But, you know, cattle as an industry is a commodity industry that deals with weight gain. And so anything they can do to get weight gains, the cheaper uh, methodology, they might do it. So that's any kind of a feed source that they can put their hands on. It is uh, any kind of a byproduct, uh, like the, the brewer's grains. You know, once they've made some alcohol or something out of different grains, if they've got one of those facilities near them, they'll feed that to cattle. Uh, they'll feed cottonseed. They'll feed uh, some of the nastier stuff is they'll feed uh, they fed chicken poop. I've, I've known cattle producers that fed chicken poop to the cows because it's a nitrogen source. Uh, it's a protein source. Uh, you know, cottonseed is about 20% fat, 20% protein. So there's a lot of cottonseed fed. Um, so, but anything that they can do to put weight gain on cattle, as long as it's dis not disallowed, then they oftentimes will do it. But cattle producers in general, you know, I think are the, the ones that I've met are a pretty good bunch. They don't do it you don't raise cattle to get rich. You raise cattle because it's a passion and because it's a lifestyle, because it's it's uh, something you love doing. Um, but in, just like in any other industry or any other part of life in this world, there's going to be people that are going to take cut corners and they're going to do this and do that. I think part of the issue when you know people are out buying beef, and I, and I have people talk to me about it all the time, and I tell them, you have to do the best you can do. You know, what's the best? The best is to find somebody like ourselves, talk to them, find out what their management practices are, what are they doing with their animals, and then, you know, try to spend your dollars the best way you can. But the other part that a lot of people may not understand is I am, I'm unusual in the fact that the animals that are born here get raised here, finished here, and they don't leave here until the day we take them to the processor probably 95% of your cattle that are in the grocery stores and, and everywhere else, they've been through three or four different hands before they get to the processor, because there's an awful lot of what they call cow calf operations. And 
and that's where they're going to get, you know, a certain a number of shots and a certain number of injectables in them. And then you have what they call the stalker phase. The stalker phase might be where somebody takes in a five or a six weight, which means five or 600 pound calf. And they're going to raise it up to a weight that the finishing yards might want. So let's say they might get it to a nine weight or to a thousand pounds. Then it'll be shipped to a finishing yard, uh, a stockyard where they'll be put on a, a daily ration. They don't have pasture. They're just in there just eating, eating, eating pretty much what they want. And they'll have a different protocol set up for those cattle. But obviously, if you think about the guy that's growing the calves, he's going to have a different need for therapeutics and for, you know, shots in the cattle than the guy that's got them in a feed yard where they're all stacked in together, you know, standing in a little bit of manure and, and this, that, and the other. It's a totally different regiment for those. So I think to answer your question is there's no telling what they might get along the line, but that's how you're going to produce the cheapest beef. You know, that's, that's, and that's what they're after. So I guess the price is one of the easiest ways to spot the kind of meat that might be running close to the edge, unless the company just has some kind of advantage in buying their meat. I don't, I can't imagine what it would be, but I notice a difference. Like when I, I don't know if you can tell by the taste of the meat, but I know when I buy meat from certain places, it just don't taste right. And then sure. I buy meat from other places that's very inexpensive, but it tastes wonderful. Most of the, the grocery store meat obviously has gone through that process I just talked about. And that meat is all irradiated. Uh, and what that means is that when the skin is taken off the animal, it runs through a box and you can go on YouTube and watch the processing facilities and see them and they irradiate that meat to try to kill pathogens. Because like you and I have talked about before, if a cow's not eating just grass and just forages, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to have that hot grain put in its, its rumen and it causes acidosis. The acidosis is where uh, a lot of these different diseases, salmonella and different things that you don't, you don't like and you don't want. And so, you know, the processing facilities, you know, they're, they're running through, they're killing 2000 plus a head a day mm. and they're running them through that process. And so that stomach uh, that has that acidosis in it splashes on the floor and up onto the carcass, they wash it down real well, but then the next process is that irradiate that radiator that, that goes through that's supposed to try to kill that stuff. Where you have those those outbreaks is you know, like in the armpits and different places that might be you know touching, and that's where all of a sudden you'll see, hey, there's this meat recall, you know, of certain brand or whatever, you know, because they didn't get it all, and and that's where that that's where that comes from. So you know, cows obviously, you know, they weren't really designed to eat grain, but feeding grain gets them fatter faster grows faster and so that's why they do it and uh but you know of course in our farm here we don't you know you know we're not doing it for that reason so uh but you know there's so there's a lot of places around nowadays where there are more and more people are doing what i'm doing and trying to put the best product they can on the market but you need to call them and talk to them you need to call them and say hey do you worm your cattle do you want if you know if that's important to you that you don't want to have a cow that's had insecticide pay for it on its back twice a year you know all those kinds of things so uh it's a matter of the consumer checking out if it's important to them um how their meat is being treated before it gets to the processor right yeah it's hard enough for people to really even get started on a, a new way of eating like this without having to process all this much information. That's why I, I kind of ask people to take this with a grain of salt, but at the same time, I want to address issues that I think are important. Sure. And I know from talking to you before and watching the way the cows eat and having that tongue go out and wrap and grab that grass like that. And I see cows all the time that are just munching right down on the ground uh, right. where, the, where the grass just comes up out of the ground. And I remember you telling me that that's one of the key ways they wind up getting worms and things like that. I see that everywhere where I pass by cattle. And yeah, it's because people won't take the, they won't or don't want to take the time to manage the herd they have and keep them in tall grass. And so they're making a conscious decision that's not as important, you know, uh, and I would rather spend the money on the chemical and put it on the cows and not worry about it. Uh, there's an awful lot of those wormer chemicals that are put in the minerals. And so they can put a mineral block out and they think it 
you know, it, it handles that. But, you know, the methodology that we use for grazing is that if they're in tall grass and they have the ability to use that tongue to wrap it around and eat it, then they're going to lay down a lot sooner. And well, the faster you can get a cow to lay down and start to process its rumen, the faster it's going to gain weight. But if they're sitting there and eating and nibbling like a sheep, then they might have to graze all day long. So you're absolutely right. I would say 90% of the cattle producers do exactly what you're talking about. They, you know, they, they don't do a daily move. Well, I know I don't like the idea of having my food irradiated per se, because I don't even like using the microwave, but mm -hmm. I guess at the same time, I know they got to teach that these processes are, are, are healthy or they have some beneficial effect to them or cattle ranchers wouldn't do it because as you said, many of them are doing it for a passion and they're learning what they learn when they go to ABAC and places like that, that teach how to do these things. So they come out feeling like this, this is the way you do it, but yet you're able to do it in such a natural way. It just seems to me that if, if you can do it, and I know a lot of other ranchers, you know, are able to do it that way, that if you can get that kind of beef, that it would be preferential. And it has been for me. One of the things I wanted to ask you about that with the irradiation process is, wouldn't that stop the antibiotics from having any live effect when they pass through? I think what this does is it it tries to negate things that are on the surface. Okay. Um, the irradiation does, and, and you know, it was back in I think the '90s, I believe that the USDA kind of changed up some of the rules on the antibiotics and they, they didn't really want agricultural folks to use antibiotics in the cattle that were normally used for humans because they wanted to not have a resistance on the antibiotics. You know, antibiotics, obviously, they work. We, you know, in humans, they work and so forth. But there's definitely, you know, they were seeing that fact happening. And so obviously, that's the reason they tried to make that change. We will occasionally use antibiotics if we're trying to save a cow's life or whatever. But then that doesn't go in our, in our meat supply at all. So we, we separate that out. But rather than have an animal suffer or whatever, we'll, you know, we will we'll treat it with antibiotics. But the, I mean, the amount of antibiotics we use here are next to nothing. There's just very, very little. Well, I love um, that transparency because that's something people would probably want to know. And if everything is always perfect, then we would know something was wrong. Uh, and even I will take antibiotics if I absolutely have to. But if the doctor is even like, well, you may not need this. I'm like, well, then I don't need it. <laughs> if you think I may not need it, I don't need it until I'm still sick afterward. Well, you know, the thing is, it's kind of like the same as in humans. You know, you can get an antibiotic, but if it's a virus that you've got, an antibiotic's not going to do anything. And so, you know, part of it is is testing and knowing what it is and then knowing how to treat it. And then there's all kinds of natural ways of treating things. And we try to lean toward those areas, you know, like our cattle get apple cider vinegar every day. Yeah. And so that helps a tremendous amount of things. But I think, you know, part of it is that all across the country, there's different things that plague the farmers. You know, it's just, it's not the same here as it's going to be, like I say, in Idaho or out West or whatever our conditions. A lot of people would think, well, they're just cows eating grass. Well, the grass is different. The climate's different. The soil's different. The minerals are different. And every bite they take, the whole nine yards is different. And so that's where cattle producers have to get educated and find out what are the problems they have in their area. And it takes a lot of education. It takes it takes a lot of research to get there. Um, Talk to me a little bit about um, the average life expectancy of a cow being raised for the purpose of meat on maybe industrial side and then compared to maybe the way you do it. Sure. Well, um, generally, if you look in the commercial world, uh, if we put some actual numbers to this, a calf will be up to a weaning weight at nine months of age. And that weaning weight might be 600 pounds. And then the backgrounder uh, or the stalker phase of that operation, the next guy, he, a lot of times he's paid by the amount of pounds that he puts on that, that animal. And it will vary on how good their grass is, you know, what they're doing with them, if they're adding feed to them. But they can put on, you know, two pounds a, a day of gain. And so they might be in that stage, say, for another uh 
say four months or six months. And then the finishing stage, they can put four pounds a day gain with that hot grain ration. So you'll have animals that'll get from birth to putting them on your plate 15 months to 18 months uh, in a in a commercial setting. Sure. But it just depends. You know, everybody is different. You know, Mike, I like to say that, you know, the ones you do uh, in the South compared to the ones that are up in the Midwest. And obviously a lot of animals are sent to the Midwest because they want to get it as close to the corn as they can get it. It's cheaper for them to ship the animal to the corn than, to, than the other way around. Okay. So that's why there's so many feed yards out in that corn belt. As far as on the grass basis, Dante, uh, once again, you know, you're looking at an animal that's going to be like, you know, born here and have stayed here. It'll take us a good two years to 28 months to get one uh, finished, uh, even up to, you know, 30 months. Um, but it depends on how much rain has God given us, you know, how uh, all of those kinds of things, what kind of cold temperatures that we had, what kind of warm temperatures we've had. If you look at it this way, we're grass farmers and cattle is what we use to get our product to the market. And so... One of the beauties of cattle raising is that we take a fiber product that God gives us the sunlight and the rain and these cows turn that just unusable fiber to a human into a healthy, healthy product. Uh, what a gift from God, in my opinion. Amen to that. Just absolute gift. And, you know, and the sheep and, and, and you can do dairies on, you know, all grass. There's plenty of people doing that. And I think that, you know, in this discussion where we're talking about vaccines and, you know, the shots and, and antibiotics and all the rest, there's so much of that that is really a factor of how crowded you make the animals. You know, God's given us the sunlight that is a tremendous sterilizer. I mean, a tremendous sterilizer. If you give the ground the opportunity and you don't hurt what's there, it comes back with just a glorious show of, of, of health. And uh, so if you can leave that grass alone for a month, guess what? It's going to be back and be luscious and glorious. That reminds me, for anybody who hasn't seen the video I did before with Miles on his farm, he talked about a lot of this. So there's a lot more information we don't need to necessarily recover. And I would like to talk a little bit more about vaccinations. But uh, one of the things I wanted to ask is, because a lot of people complain that when they buy grass-fed beef, that it's tougher and that it's not very fatty and one of the things I've found lately is the more fat, the better. That was something I was kind of upset about most recently when I picked up my beef that the, they cut the fat off that I didn't want them to cut off. Why, why is it that your cows are able to get so much fatter than what it seems like the store-bought beef that's grass-fed doesn't have? Well, it's because we don't kill them till they're fat. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that will, they, they want to, they want to stay on a schedule because that's their financial model. And right. they want to say, Hey, you know, we're, we've got this 50 head of steers and, uh, we're gonna, you know, we're out of grass going into the winter. We're going to kill them. Well, there'll be some that'll be fat. There'll be some that are medium. And there'll be some that don't have any fat at all. Mm. Well, you know, I, my personal belief is for good grass fed beef, it's got to have the fat. And so we just don't want to kill anything until it's fat enough to kill. And oftentimes I have customers that are clamoring and begging me for beef and they've been on the waiting list a while. I just have to explain to them. It's, it's not fat enough. It's not, it's not ready to be killed. And um, we had a, you know, not to toot our own horn, but we had a processor that we send beef to. And I had a guy that contacted me the other day and he said, I want to talk to you. And I said, okay. And he said, well, I went to the processor and asked him who is producing the best grass-fed beef. And he said, you want to talk to Big Mo? He said, there's nobody that puts in animals in here that, are, that have the fat cover and the fat that he does. And he said, I don't know exactly what he does, but somehow he puts the fat on these animals. And it is really because they're in tall grass, they can lay down and ruminate. It's things we do to the grass to get the bricks up. The bricks is a measure of the sugars in the grass and so we want them eating all sweet grass. Yeah. And that's what we do. 
Well, I want to make sure before we finish today to, to be able to get some information of how people can get a hold of you if they have any questions, or maybe you can point them in the right direction. And I'll also cover how I found you to begin with. Real quick, I do want to touch on vaccines. I, I've been doing some research on cattle vaccinations, and it seems like it's a very common practice that they're used to doing vaccinations. The one concern I had when I watched a lot of the videos is that if they're using live vaccines, they could very easily be contaminating their own product. And that I think probably happens more often than it than it should based on human nature and what they were saying about it. But then also we wanted to touch on the new mRNA vaccines because I get a little leery personally when we start talking about changing the genetic code or using something that affects our genetic code the way messenger RNA does with our RNA, and it's basically them programming it to do certain things with proteins. And I don't know if you have any awareness of any of that, but I would like to know what you know about vaccinations and how does that affect the meat long-term or does it affect the meat long-term? Well, the vaccinations that are generally using, and we'll put the the mRNA uh, stuff on the side burner here for a second, and the, the general vaccinations, and once again, farmers are all different. There is commercially sold a three-way, a five-way, a seven-way, an eight-way, all vaccinations that are put in a single dose. There are all kinds of boosters, and once again, when you're looking at the economic model of producing cattle, they want to try to get the most amount of pounds of beef off an acre of land that they can. Now, since we're different and, and we raise cattle on just grass alone, uh, we don't try to, to stock heavy. Uh, we want the cattle to be able to go through a paddock, eat the ice cream off the top and go on. But if you're a guy that's running that different model, you're going to put these vaccines out there. And to give you an idea, there's there's something called black leg. When a calf gets past the age of four months or five months of age, they can get something. I don't know the scientific name for it, but cattle farmers call it black leg and it'll kill the calf. So if you if you raise cattle the way that the universities are going to teach you to raise them, they're going to say you can't afford not to vaccinate all your animals. Well, we've never vaccinated for gap for black leg. And to my knowledge, we've never lost a calf to black leg. So, you know, can you raise cattle without those vaccines? My answer is yes. Are you going to lose some animals maybe along the way? There might be a time when you're going to lose some animals along the way. But the general idea with vaccines, they've made them cheap enough that a lot of cattle producers say, I can't afford not to just vaccinate my animals every year. Uh, we don't vaccinate, and uh, we very seldom ever see a vet. But, you know, if you keep cows in tall grass and you keep them moving and you utilize the sunlight to sterilize your pastures and you don't make a cow eat where it pooped yesterday, then you, you solve a lot of those problems. You solve a bunch of those problems. Yeah, I remember so, that when you were showing me your farm, how they just they are always moving. They don't They don't stay in the same place for more than 24 hours and sometimes half that, right? Yeah, sometimes a third of that. Yeah, sometimes mm -hmm. we move twice a day. Um, so, you know, once again, it's it's everybody's own management style. You know, cattle cattle producers are a pretty independent group, and so if they're being taught by the universities this is the way to do it, then they, they'll probably go that way. I, I'm not throwing stones at any of them. You know, they're doing it the way they want to do it, and you know, we're doing it the way we want to do it. Um, and so we, we certainly don't have everything figured out. I don't have a college degree. I, I'm not that smart. And uh, so but we're just doing what what's worked for us. Uh, oh, let's go back to are the vaccines in the meat? Uh, the vaccines are absolutely in the meat. If the vaccines weren't in the meat, then uh, they wouldn't be working. OK, uh, when you give those shots, they're intermuscular. Uh, they have some things that you give, uh, you know, just under the skin and some things that are in the muscle. And so if they've got something that they're giving every year, then they're thinking that they need it every year. But I think there's there's no doubt you can't put something on cattle or in cattle that's not in the cattle. And that was always my belief. And since, as you know, the reason we started doing this was for my family's health, um, we, I just decided I'm gonna do it without. And uh, we're gonna that's gonna be our experiment. 
And so that's what we've done for all these years. Now, as far as the mRNA stuff, you know, there's so much going all over this thing and, and everybody's got their own opinion on vaccinations and this product and all the rest. You know, I will just tell you that my family didn't do vaccinations. You know, I think it's everybody's choice as to what they want to do. But are they starting to put it in cattle? I've seen articles that say they have. Uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Malone uh, says that they are. He obviously is one of the originators of the vaccine. I think he holds a number of the patents in it. Hmm. You know, there's the, the New York Times and different people have tried to say bad things about him and to blackball him and this, that, and the other. But at the same time, you know, this guy's got the patents on him. I mean, he, he knows these vaccines. He knows, you know, what they're all about. And, and I think time will tell us on these vaccines, you know, how bad they are or they aren't. Uh, you know, I'm of the opinion that that's, you know, if I can raise cattle without it, why do I want it? Right. Uh, that's my opinion. And that's so, the way I am when it comes to buying meat. I want to get as little of anything modified or played with or changed in any way I can. If I can get it natural, that's that's what I want. And I think a lot of people watching would want that too. So that's why I wanted to be able to discuss these things. Sure. And, you know, I, I had made the same decision when it came to vaccination. And I'm glad I was able to make that decision because I've seen some things that I don't, I don't even like to be able, I probably can't get into because this will be on YouTube. but at the same time, I want to be able to say that it's about you making decisions about what you want to put in your body. And that's why I'm doing this diet is to have a healthy mind and body. So I want to be able to get the best meat I can. Now I know, and I found your uh, organization, I went to a company or not a, or a company, I went to an organization called usabeef.org. And I feel like I hit the jackpot because you were so close to me. You were the first one I called and you told me about your process and then I got to come down and see it. And I've been so happy with it ever since. It's just been a, a blessing. And I know also some of my viewers have mentioned that they've talked to you and that you put them in touch with people that you knew in other areas. And if I remember correctly, you even talked about teaching some other people how to do your process. Yes. So tell us a little bit about one, how they can get in touch with you if they wanted to. And also how they can find somebody local that raises their cattle the way you do. One thing you could do, well, as far as contacting me, uh, you can just email me at uh, Big Mo Cattle, uh, B I G M O C A T T L E, uh, at Gmail. And that's probably the easiest way to, to get in touch with me. As far as finding someone, you can go to the sites uh, that you just mentioned. If you say, you know, I'm really not finding anybody, find a local arbiter, a local butcher that is processing meat for farmers and say, is there anybody doing grass fed? You know, do you know anybody in the area that's doing grass fed beef? And then get the name from them, call them, ask them. You know, the way I have so many different contacts and I don't have them everywhere, you know, a number of people that, you know, from your your YouTube that have contacted me and said, Hey, do you have somebody in this area or this area? And I said, nah, that's not a part of my, you know, contact uh, realm, but the way I have so many is because there's, it's kind of a, a pretty close net group. And I was the president of a Devon association for, uh, for a while. And uh, so I have all those contacts of people that are doing it. And uh, so sometimes I can, you know, I can put them in the right direction and, and help them find somebody. But I think, you know, there's uh, eatwild.com is Eat a wild. great site for finding people. Uh, that gal does a great job, uh, but also talking to processing facilities, these smaller processing facilities, you can call them and say, hey, who do you know that's doing a, a good job with grass-fed beef? And then call the people and ask them how they're, how they're managing it and, and see if you can get somebody that's doing what would make you happy. So you would look up meat processing and butcher would be a couple yes. of keyword terms. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'd look them up in your area and try to find somebody close to you. Um, and there's, you know, like within an hour from me, there's five in my area that are processors. So if you were to call any one of those five, then, you know, they would have names of, of grass fed producers in, in the area. Awesome. Well, Miles, I sure do appreciate you spending some time with me today. This time just flew by. It's such good information. I, I wish we could talk some more, but I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Sounds good. We'd love to do it.
You're looking great, Dante. Enjoy the videos, man. <laughs> Thank you so much. Brother, I can't wait to talk to you again. You Let's have a great it. one. You too. Bye-bye. If we pay extra, could we maybe get some grease or fat?